Old Testament reading for this the seventh Sunday after Pentecost is taken from the prophet Zechariah in the ninth chapter. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus said, Come to me, all 
you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. This is an important text, not because it's like my, one of my favorite accounts in the Bible, which is Jesus in the boat with his disciples, and the storm comes up, and the go, going gets tough, and what does Jesus do? He takes a nap. Now there's rest for you. And so I always say, hey, if I take a nap every once in a while, I'm in good company. If it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. But Jesus has more in mind with this statement than just taking a nap, as good as that may be. In fact, it has much more to do with your salvation and the salvation of the world. When Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest, he expects everyone who has been schooled in the Old Testament to have a little light bulb go off and go, ah, this is the Messiah. This is the one who has been promised to Israel over the centuries. And he's calling them and letting them know that that's true. The imagery of rest you see in the Old Testament is prevalent in many ways and many forms. One, of course, you probably write, think of is, right, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. On that Sabbath day, on the Saturday in the Old Testament, you were to cease from work. But there's other images of rest, too, in Holy Scripture. That is, for example, the promised land is called God's rest. The people of Israel will receive rest when they enter into the promised land. And the book of Hebrews, when it talks about uh, rest, combines the two images of the Sabbath day and the promised land uh, in its discussion of Jesus being the ultimate true rest. Also, David, as king, is promised rest from his enemies. And so rest is not simply relaxation, but it is also security. No more fear. No more danger. No more worries. This is the sort of rest that Jesus has in mind when he calls to you and says, Come unto me and I will give you rest. Now, in the Old Testament, with the Sabbath day, it served a very important function, as it was a weekly reminder of God's promise that he was going to send the Messiah. For six days, you labored by the sweat of your brow. In other words, you labored in fulfillment of the curse. That because of the fall, now things are going to be difficult. Sin is in the world, and where sin is, it goofs stuff up. And so, for six days, you were reminded of that. We are still reminded of that in our day and age. No matter how smart we are, no matter how much technology we have, stuff still breaks. Stuff still doesn't work that exact moment you need it to work. And the more technology we get and have, the more I say technology hates me and the feeling is mutual. Because sure enough, the fall shows itself in one way or another. By letting us down, by making life difficult, by earning our bread by the sweat of our brow. The Israelites were reminded for six days, but on the seventh day they were to rest, and this was to remind them of the coming Messiah. The one who had uh, been promised all along, who was going to undo the results of the fall. Who was going to solve the problem that sin had created in our world. And it appears that the patriarchs longed and looked for this uh, throughout their time. For example, uh, Luther believed, and I think he's right, that Eve thought Cain was going to be the Messiah, which makes sense if you realize, right? God tells her the seed of a woman is going to crush the head of Satan, and she looks around, and she's the only woman. But she's wrong, because Cain is not the Messiah, far from it. But that hope, that desire that God would send the Messiah clung to God's people. It shows itself again with the naming of Noah. Noah is, can mean comfort, your Bible will tell you, but it also literally means rest. And Noah's parents, when he's born, say, 
that they name him Noah because their hope is what? That he will give us rest from the ground which the Lord has cursed. Now, they're not, you know, all excited as maybe your grandparents were that they got another farmhand. They're thinking bigger fish. They're thinking more important things. They're thinking this might be the one we pray and hope it is the one who is the Messiah. And again, they're wrong. Noah does better than Cain, of course, right? He's a righteous man and, and he's a believer in God. But he's not the Messiah. He's a type of the Messiah. He points forward to the Messiah. But the Messiah has not come yet. And so, again, for six days, you labor the seventh day, you look for this rest that's been promised. And Jesus here in our gospel lesson announces, it's come. He is our rest. He is the one who has, to begin with, restored the relationship between us and God. Unlike Adam and Eve, we don't need to go flee and hide from God. God comes looking for us just as he did with them. And he comes and he announces what his son has done for us. That our sins are forgiven. Forgiven. And that's an important message for us because in the trials and tribulations of this life where we see the fall, we not only see the fall all around us, we see it within us. Did you hear what Paul said? The fall within him? The good that I want to do. This I don't do. The evil I hate, I don't want to do. I find myself doing it. Oh, wretched man that I am. He longs for the ultimate rest, but he knows where rest is to be found, and it has come to us in our justification before God through Christ. And that's what he says. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The one who has restored the relationship, given us rest with the Heavenly Father, will also return and reestablish perfect rest for us. He will return things to the way they were intended to be. And we will no longer have to fight the ravages of the fall. This means we have not a Sabbath day, but a Sabbath person. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now part and parcel of understanding, of course, is to recognize and see that everything in the Old Testament is pointing forward to the Messiah. Imagine that. That what God is doing in the Old Testament with his requirements, with his gathering of people of Israel, and everything that he does in every shape and form is to prepare God's people for the coming Messiah. The sacrifices prepare you for the substitution that had to be made by the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ in your behalf. The temple where God dwells with his people is found now in the temple of Jesus Christ. As God and man have become one, and the Son of God is now our brother. These things are what the Old Testament is pointing forward to. And so we no longer have a Sabbath day, but we have a Sabbath person. The whole issue of the Sabbath, by the way, there's three opportunities, uh, three options out there, rather, uh, to understand it. Not counting the one I just gave you, which I think is the right option. Right? But there are three that are out there. One, it would be held by Seventh-day Adventists and probably and by Jews today, right? And that Saturday is the Sabbath, and it's still binding. And it's still God's desire that you keep Saturday Sabbath. And the thing about that particular uh, position is that's good about it is it does have biblical witness. The Bible does say that. In the Old Testament. But a recognition and relationship and understanding of the relationship between the Old and New Testament is hugely important here. Roman Catholicism says this that Sunday is the Sabbath, and this shows the power of the church, the power of the papacy of the Pope, that he can even change the commands of God for the sake of the church. Show me that in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And the third option is maybe the one you believe. I believed at one time because I didn't understand what was going on in Scripture. 
is that, oh no, Sunday's the Sabbath, and God changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, but your good friends in the Seventh-day Adventist Church will say, show me that in the Bible. And they're right. You won't find it in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible does it say God said Sunday is the Sabbath. Now, where does it say? And that brings us back to the fourth option, which to me is much more satisfying, makes much more sense of the whole Old Testament. Jesus is the Sabbath. We have a Sabbath person, the one who gives us rest. And so just like all the sacrifices no longer need to be offered that were required in the Old Testament because he is the Lamb of God, because he is the one who fulfills that. And just as I no longer need to be circumcised or I no longer need to worship at the temple or I no longer need to offer uh, particular sacrifices for particular things or eat certain foods, I'm no longer bound by the Sabbath that has fulfilled its purpose. And it was to point forward to Christ. Historically, the Lutheran Church, with the Church Catholic, has always recognized Sunday as a good tradition. We keep Sunday because it's a good tradition. Why? In honor of the resurrection day. Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. That's a good thing. That's the wrong one. And I would argue in most circumstances and situations, we should keep that good tradition. By the way, I go to Benjamin and Clickitat. The vicar goes to Benjamin and Clickitat on Saturdays. Because even though Sunday is a good tradition and you should keep it if you can, it's much more important to receive word and sacrament. And so that's the only day they can receive it from us. Because I can't, I know you can't believe this, but I can't be in more than one place at one time. I've tried, it doesn't work. Um, and so... It doesn't matter what day any longer from that standpoint. There is no command. We do keep Sunday as a good tradition. And also the eighth day, which makes sense too, right? The eighth day is what? The beginning of the new creation. St. Paul says that anybody who's in Christ Jesus is a new creation. Jesus can say to us, <clears throat> come to me and I will give you rest. And he does already now in our relationship to the Father. And when you know that, Pretty good rest. You don't have to worry about whether or not God accepts you, how God feels about you, even though you're a sinner. Even though, like St. Paul, you say, the good I don't want, I want to do this, I don't do the evil I don't want to do, I just find myself doing. You know, you have rest in Christ because of his work in your behalf. And his promise ultimately is what? That he's going to restore all things, the total new creation, when he returns. And so the church has always prayed, come quickly, Lord Jesus, and grant us also that rest. When we pray, thy kingdom come, we're praying for that ultimate rest um, that God has planned for us. I've mentioned this before. Uh, when I get up sometimes out of, you know, off the ground floor and I'm doing some work or something like that, and I moan and groan, my wife says to me, what's that? I say, old man noises. And then I say, well, actually, it's new man voices. It's my body doing what? Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There will be a new creation. Lord Jesus, thy kingdom come. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus always.